Today we're going to take a look at some of the regenerative agriculture success stories. The ones where a small change here and a step back there caused a snowball effect where a handful of people managed to be so successful in their transition that they were able to change the minds of entire districts and industries. Those who, even though they were armed with all of the chemical weapons that are so heavily encouraged, nearly lost everything. When their backs were against the wall and there was nothing more to lose, well, throwing all caution into the wind and going against everything that conventional farming has been telling us for the last century turned out to be the way to go. And boy, did these brave souls do more to prove what we've been saying for years than most. Not only does regenerative ag work, it's the only way to go forward if you have any hopes of turning a profit. Don't believe us? Let's have a listen to the people across the globe who are on the ground who nearly lost it all to modern farming and then gained it all back when they went back to the old ways. Starting with Australia, in New South Wales, and a little faraway place called Burrawa. In 1982, David Marsh looked out at his grasslands. But they weren't grasslands anymore. He was staring out at the desert. A few years of drought, and many more years before that of barely scraping by, constantly struggling to get anything for his livestock to grow, he was at his wit's end. He had no grass, barely any sheep, and certainly no money to speak of. He'd just come back from a seminar on regenerative farming, and since he was going to lose the farm anyway, well, what harm would it do to plant a few native trees? We're not kidding. Besides planning his feeding rotations a little better, giving swatches time to rest in between grazings, all that David did was to plant native trees and a few edible weeds that he'd been doing his damnedest to kill off all these years. He threw away the sprays and let the fields do what they did naturally. David didn't just recover financially. He's since been able to rear every single sheep without the need to buy additional feed again. And where the rest of New South Wales are suffering under the latest drought, David's soil still retains water thanks to all the trees that also give off feed and have been able to trap moisture in the ground. A few farmers in Australia have since been moving towards regenerative practices, and they've been doing so well that the Australian Bureau of Statistics quietly watched them over a 10-year period. According to their data, regenerative farmers earn more than conventional farmers, and that number goes even higher during periods of drought. Unlike the rest, Team Regenerative's businesses is booming above everyone else. And now let's move over to Britain, where strict laws around spraying fields already exist. That's not to say that no chemical aids are allowed. Just that half of what's legal in the U.S. is not permitted to be used on British soil. But one farmer decided to have a talk with some pre-World War II farmers before he sprayed what the rest did to find out how they used to do things before chemical warfare went from the battlefields to the lands. Peter Grieg isn't some new face on the field. No, no. He and his wife Henri have been raising Devon Red Ruby cattle for 30 years without buying a single bale of hay. Instead, they plant clover, wildflowers, and whatever else used to grow in those hills before they got there. After the cows have gone through to clear it out and left all of their droppings behind and tilled the field with their hooves, Peter comes around and replenishes the soil with a handful of seeds again. His pride and joy are the steaming piles of poop. He calls those cow patties the biggest industry on his farm and glows with pride when he sees the bugs and grubs making nests in it. In a place where feeding livestock becomes almost impossible during the cold months, Peter, his cows, and his piles of dungs are doing marvelously. He says that without the cost of fees, sprays, and fertilizers, he's got nothing but clear skies ahead, and he's never had a reason in three whole decades that threatened to shut his gates before. The Grieg story mirrors many in Britain, and it's even reached the ears of Top Gear's Jeremy Clarkson. Since the premiere of Clarkson's farm, he's been on a mission to repair England's farmlands. He went into the venture with very little experience, unless you count a hobby farm that led to the death of his family's young donkey that exploded on a hot summer's day, but that's a story you'll have to read in his series of hilarious and successful books. Anyway, Clarkson needed help, so he teamed up with Omex SAP to tackle the dire situation of England's struggling farmers. Omex's main goals are to reduce agrochemicals and to increase soil health by making use of natural ways to feed the soil. Omex sees the soils like people see their bodies. You are what you eat. And the ground needs that same natural nutrition if it's going to produce nutritional food. Clarkson gives screen time to farmers who've turned away from chemical use and have been successful in their ventures. He encourages and funds beekeeping. And his farm, Diddley Squad Farms, named so because he says he makes no money from it. He uses a wide variety of old and new ways to farm just to see how each system actually does in the long run. Clarkson isn't all for regenerative farming, nor is he against it. 
He's the kind of guy who likes to try it himself and let the crops do the talking. Initially, he began the show with every intention of spraying the living daylights out of every square inch of his property. But as the episodes wear on, and he visits more farms and tries out every way to work a field that he's been told about, you see his outlook gradually start to change. It's a wild ride, full of hilarity, and most of all, a man who has his heart in the right place. Clarkson just wanted to save England's farmers, and without even meaning to, he's become one of the biggest drivers of regenerative agriculture in our modern day and age. And that's why we love his approach so much. He puts his support behind the methods that he's tried himself. And most of the time, the ones that went out at the end of the day are the old ways. It's a little muggy in England, though. Time to seek out some sun south of the equator. Let's go have a look at what's happening down in Mexico, specifically in the district of Chiapas. Chiapas holds 30% of the country's fresh water, and by all means, they should be the highest producer of food. 55% of the district's forests and grasslands have been cleared out over the years to make room for ranches and farmlands. Yet every single year, they've produced less and less yields. Acres upon acres now look like deserts when they used to be green and lush just 50 years ago. Every year, the old fields are burned down, the fertilizer gets tilled in, and the herbicides and pesticides are deployed to kill what little did manage to survive the burning. And every year, the forest dwindles more and more. But the environmental activists in Mexico had a rather unconventional way of saving their environment. They weren't too fussed about holding up banners and tying themselves to fences. No, these guys are proactive. They gave what financial aid they could to the small holdings and homesteads. Anyone with a few acres to spare were encouraged to leave their corn husks and stalks right there in the field after a harvest instead of burning it. They were asked to plant fruit-bearing trees among the rows of corn, too. Even if it was just a few chickens to supply the household, anything to add biodiversity to the land. This approach, where activists weren't fighting to keep farmers off the land, but instead to build them up and make what little they had more productive, was so successful that the government took notice. Mexico has now banned all imports of corn from the U.S., and small-scale farmers that were once forced to forage for food in the forest so that their families wouldn't starve to death are not just keeping up with demand, they're rising far above it. The numbers show that farms have slashed their expenses by half, yet their profits have risen by up to 7% in some areas. They're financially and productively producing more than they ever made before, all because of agroforestry and by adding more livestock. To make matters even more promising, the forest has stopped shrinking, and it's slowly beginning to creep back out again. Back in 2020, Kenya teamed up with Agra, took just 50 bean and banana farms, and instructed them to apply regenerative methods on their lands. More trees, more animals, minimal tilling, and no chemicals at all. But the two biggest points of focus was to move away from monocropping and to plan grazing more attentively to avoid overgrazing and the ever-present erosion crisis. By implementing rotational grazing and adding more diversity to their crops and their animals, that band of 50 farms were so successful in their two-year trial run that the project has been ballooned to include a further 50,000 farms. There was a notable increase in soil fertility. Output in crops on the market increased by 20%. They had before them a 0% loss in crops. You heard that right, 0%. And even better, the government initially offered state-funded farmhands to aid the farmers in those beginning stages of the operation, but they couldn't quite supply all the manpower that they promised. But most of the farmers were willing to send the hands that were available to farms just signing on to the project because it turns out that they just didn't need the extra help after all. After the first few months, all the structural changes were implemented. And after that point, the manual labor required to keep up with this new system proved to be so much less demanding than they thought that they were happy to take care of it themselves without the offered help. The leap from 50 to 50,000 happened in just two years. The plan is to use the next two years as cold hard proof to include the rest of the country. But Kenya is doing something else right. They're offering their farmers training, too. It's not just about applying these methods. It's about telling people why and how it works, giving them a new perspective on taking care of the land that's expected to take care of the people in turn. There are more than 800 million farmers in India, making them the biggest agricultural country per capita in the world. But India is also one of the countries that's been hit the most aggressively by industrial farming practices of all. To say that their soil is tired is an understatement. And it's not because India has been growing too much food. It's that there's just no life left in the soil after decades of pesticide pressure. And now nothing will even break down in the sand to feed the seed that's been laid down. Every year, there's a record crop loss of $5 billion, and that's not counting the small holdings and family-run operations. To make matters worse, the problems topside are the least of their worries. 
the diminishing groundwater has reached such alarmingly low levels that India is looking at the very real possibility of a water crisis, a first for the mostly tropical country. An organization called Regenegri, developed jointly by Solidaridad and Control Union, are hoping to tackle the problem from two sides. They want to take the old methods of generations past and to combine them with our modern, fact-based regenerative methods. By proving that the two are essentially one and the same, they hope to get the deeply traditional nation on board. This is a very new venture, only started in 2023, and it will be a while before we see any results. But it's looking like it's going to be a huge government-funded project. So far, more than a million acres of land has been set aside, and work has already begun, so they're not playing around at all. What worries us is that companies in names like Nestle and Rockefeller Foundation are a part of this attempt to reform Indian farming practices. The news that these two companies were in on it had us reaching for our tinfoil hats. Neither of them have a great track record in the past for treating soil very well or about caring what poison they put into their products. So, no, we don't like their past methods, but there's no question that the money they bring could change this game completely. You can be sure of one thing. We're going to keep an eye on this shindig. Asia has been slow to lean into better farming practices, and this is the first project with any true driving force behind it. We guess only time will tell. And finally, we make it full circle to the USA. And we cannot end this off without mentioning Joel Salatine. Look, there are plenty of amazing things happening in the regenerative ag world. Companies like Starbucks, major alcohol brands, and more and more produce farms all jumping on the bandwagon every day. Stock market value for organic ag has risen, and almost no celebrity product is made without it being sourced from a sustainable piece of land. But Joel, who likes to call himself a lunatic farmer, is the father of regenerative agriculture in the 21st century. And in typical American fashion, Joel does a little bit of everything. He couldn't just settle on applying one or two techniques. No, he does it all. Rotational grazing, feeding his chickens on his compost piles with no additional feed at all, agroforestry, no chemicals, no monocropping. We could go on and on all day. But it's not just the fact that he runs a successful farm, producing infinitely more on less land than everyone else. It's that he's seen at every conference and every event. He's on podcasts. He writes books. This man is so busy spreading the word far and wide that sometimes we wonder if he ever sleeps at all. When Joel took over his father's failing farm, his failure was already set in stone, and everyone thought he was a lunatic when he turned the whole shebang on its head and did it the old way. And his success was earth-shattering. Erosion, depletion, pests, and death. He walked onto a land that had every pitfall you could think of, and yet, he didn't just manage to survive. He and his land absolutely thrived. And he's got the receipts to prove it. But really, you just have to take a look at his green fields, his fat chickens, and his overproductive cows to see the proof is in the pudding. Joel's insistence on going all in with every single venture he takes on, stubbornly turning his back on every destructive practice that's been put in place in the last century, has rewritten the whole rule book. And everywhere his methods are applied, the soil produces more. And even the surrounding lands show improvement just by their close proximity to all that diversity. It's thanks to his willingness to involve himself with homesteaders and small-scale farmers across the country, giving his advice freely. It's overhauled the small-scale community in a way that's never been done before. It's that thriving community that has been one of the biggest driving forces for us to even seek out new, or shall we say, old ways of doing things. If you ever wondered whether or not moving away from commercial farming and into regenerative agriculture was worth it, just look at Joel. The man literally had nothing, and today he's one of the most successful people in the business. The successes are more than we can possibly fit into a single video, but one thing's certain, regenerative agriculture isn't some fad that's going to disappear tomorrow. Never do you hear of a farmer who made the change and was unhappy about the results. The only thing that's keeping us producing with the conventional way is our natural proclivity to hate change. Every statistic, every sale, and every harvest is proving time and time again that it works. And the more people coming forward to show the fruits of their efforts, the more they are willing to give it a try themselves. The changes don't even have to be all that big, but the difference in your production sure will be. Tell us about your successes and what you're going to begin applying next. If there's one thing that we can take away from today's video, it's that even one man, one acre, can inspire entire countries to be better. And while you're leaving that comment below, don't forget to like and subscribe. Or have a look at one of the videos on your screen right now. Until next time, take care of yourself and the ground beneath your feet.